at uh, Henderson, or, or married by brother Henderson at Idabel, outside of Bell, Oklahoma. That's where they both grew up. He's a priest in many different churches of Oklahoma, in Texas, Arkansas, Nebraska, Colorado. He's been preaching for 54 years. And he's currently in his sixth year preaching for the uh, church in the Pritchett community that's between Big Sandy and Gilmer in East Texas. Uh, he has two grown sons, one Paul and daughter-in-law Diane live in Austin, and foster son Lee uh, presently lives with them. And he has a book out, he's got it on sale in the uh, book room in the back, over 200 colloquial sayings and expressions. And uh, he's got one expression there, you know, fix it with bailing wire, he said most people don't know what that means. I could ask the young people here, what does fixing it with bailing wire mean? Well, I know what it means. I, in fact, I kept the bathing wire in the house for, uh, just got rid of it this last week. <laughs> so I, I know what that means. But the subject is an important subject for us to consider. And as Christians, we must uh, uh, understand what the teaching is on this, and we must oppose those who try to propagate it and impose it upon this nation. Now, Brother Dove uh, is going to speak on abortion. Uh, murdering a baby or just removing a blob of protoplasm? Brother Dove? A little embarrassed to talk about myself, but uh, began with uh, in uh, 2006, I found, for chance, I was having a general uh, checkup that I had some nodules in my right lung, and they removed those. That is, I, the lower part of my right lung was removed. And uh, recently, I found out uh, the cancer has come back, and so Monday I'll start chemo. But what was shocking to me was my wife was having an x-ray on her hip and perchance they found some nodules in her right lung. And uh, so I'll start chemo Monday at Tyler and she will have uh, a test run down through the bronchial tube to determine what extent uh, the malignancy is and where it is spread. So keep us in your prayers. Uh, that little girl has been walking by my side for almost 50 years. Since the beginning of time, man has failed to appreciate the sanctity of human life. This is especially true when it's the life of someone else. Within the second generation, Cain murdered his own brother Abel. Since then, the taking of innocent lives has accelerated at an enormous rate. Every single human being was created in the image of God, beginning with Adam, as we learn in Genesis, the first chapter. You are an eternal soul. I am an eternal soul. Any one of us 
is worth more than the entire physical universe. Who said so? Jesus indicated this by a twofold inquiry at Matthew 16, 26. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? This is true of every single person who has ever lived, including the unborn. The lives of the infirmed, elderly, children, and the unborn are especially in danger because of a callous and unloving society. Selfishness and self-centeredness is the root of the drastic behavior among those that are taking the lives of the innocent and the most vulnerable in society. We learn about that which God especially hates in Proverbs, the sixth chapter, and ends up in verse 17. Among the seven things are the hands that shed innocent blood, and those that take the lives of the innocent, those that take the lives of the unborn, are murderers. regardless of whether it's legal in the nation or not. The horrible history of man in sacrificing their own children to idols is something that we're aware of. Even as the children of Israel were leaving Egypt and going to the promised land of Canaan, God warned them not to take the ways of those heathen people. In Leviticus 18.21, the Lord says, And thou shalt not let any of the seed, thy seed, pass through the fire of Molech, neither shalt thou profane the name of the Lord God, I am the Lord. Then in Leviticus 20, verses 2 through 5, Again, thou shalt say to the children of Israel, Whosoever he be of the children of Israel are the strangers that sojourn in Egypt, that giveth any of his seed unto Molech. He shall surely be put to death. The people of the land shall stone him with stones. And I will set my face against the man, and will cut him off from among the people, because he has given his seed unto Molech, to defile my sanctuary, and profane my holy name. And if the people of the land do any way hide their eyes from this man, when he giveth of his seed unto Molech, and kill him not, then I will set my face against that man and against his family and will cut him off and all that go a whoring after him to commit whoredom with Moloch from whom uh, among their people. Then in Deuteronomy the 12th chapter, verses 29 and 31, God warns them not to offer their children to him. Not to take up the ways of those people and offer their children unto him. The southern kingdom of Judah reached its lowest level during the reign of Ahaz and Manasseh. We learn in 2 Kings, the 16th chapter, and 2 Kings, the 21st chapter, that these two kings actually offered their sons as offerings under this false god, Molech. In Jeremiah 7, 30 and 31, For the children of Judah have done evil in my sight, saith the Lord, 
they have set their abomination in the house which is called by my name to pollute it. And they have built the high places of Topheth, which is in the valley of the son of Hinnom, to burn their sons and their daughters in the fire which I commanded them not. Neither came it into my heart. Again, Jeremiah 7, 30 and 31. You might recall that God did command Abraham to offer his son Isaac as an offering unto him, but that was a test. Abraham didn't question God. Elsewhere in the scripture, he had faith that God would revive that son and bring him back to life. But in Genesis 22, verses 11 through 13, an angel of God, representing God, spoke unto Abraham. Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God. Seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. Now then, let's get to the real core of our lesson. There have been many attempts to justify abortion. My assignment is to discuss this sinful act of destroying human life of those who have not been born as yet. Two false concepts concerning Genesis 2 verse 7 that I wish to discuss at this time. In Genesis 2, verse 7, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the earth and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Two false concepts. One erroneous interpretation of that verse claims the physical breath is a soul. The other believes that the Lord does not instill a soul into that body until it comes forth and breathes its first breath. Both are false to the core. Those who hold either of these concepts do not believe that the unborn at any stage of its development is a human being. They hold animals at, in a higher esteem than the unborn of humans, indeed, we do not, they do not look upon abortion as murdering a baby, but removing a blob of protoplasm. It is certainly true that the word spirit in both the Hebrew and Greek language carries the meaning of breath or wind, but it but to contend that the human soul is the breath that we breathe is not right. Jesus said in John 4, 24, God is a spirit. Would they dare say that God is just the wind? That would have to be the logical conclusion. The atheistic organization Freedom from Religious Foundation Incorporation credits the Bible in teaching that the soul of man is merely the air we breathe and uses Genesis 2 verse 7 to back up their claim. It claims that the Western civilization was developed not from religious people, but from non-religious people. And it would like to destroy religion altogether. It boasts 
that it has taken the lead in humane treatment of such as those who are pre uh, for prison reform, for humane society, uh, pardon me, for humane treatment of the mentally ill, euthanasia, in which they describe as providing death with dignity to the critically ill, terminally ill, the end of slavery, and whatever they consider as woman's rights, they claim they were the first to speak out on these things. But how could that be? We will talk about that in a moment. But they talk about women's rights. Looking over their list reveals from this that they're more concerned for imprisoned criminals than they are the unborn babes. They speak out that they were the first on these things, but how could they be the first to speak out against slavery? When it was only incorporated in Wisconsin in 1978, the 13th Amendment outlawing slavery came about in December the 18th, 1865. This atheistic organization points out that the word abortion is not even in the Bible. So what? The word white slavery is not in the Bible. But prostitution is wrong regardless. The word rape is not in the Bible. But the very act is a heinous, sinful act. Words are vehicles of thought. And sometimes words change in meanings. If you were to go to an English dictionary and look up the word baptism, it would include sprinkling and pouring, because that's how people use it. But if you want to know, learn the true meaning of baptism, you go to the Greek lexicon to learn that it means to dip, to plunge, to immerse. And so, in order to learn the true meanings of words, biblical words, you must go back to the Hebrew and Greek lexicons and study to see how they were originally used. Another thing that we must take in consideration when we talk about Genesis 2-7, the Lord formed man of the dust of the earth, Adam and Eve were created supernaturally. They were not developed from the womb of a female. You and I were brought into this world through the natural laws. Therefore, there is a difference. If you have your Bibles, turn over to Exodus, the 21st chapter. In Exodus, the 21st chapter, verses 22 and 23, the, that same atheist foundation tries to prove from that passage that a miscarriage is taken into consideration and that the fruit of woman that comes forth is not a human being. Let's read the passage and take this in consideration. Exodus 21, verses 22 and 23. If men strive and hurt a woman with child so that her fruit depart from her, and yet... No mischief follow. He shall be surely punished according as the woman's husband will lay upon him. And he shall pay as the judge determined. And if any mischief follow, then thou shalt give life for life. Well, those people claim this is a miscarriage. But it's actually a premature birth. The word fruit here comes from the Greek word yele, which means child, and is so translated at Genesis 21, verse 8, and the child, referring to Isaac, and the child grew and was weaned. So the word as fruit 
In Exodus 21, 22, and 23, it's translated as child in Genesis 21, verse 8. The absence of the vital signs of life is not a definite proof of death. Physical death includes, uh, pardon me, uh, physical signs of life uh, includes pulsation, blood pressure, temperature and respiration, breathing. Uh, the biblical definition of physical death is when the spirit leaves the body. James 2.26, For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Actually, the word death means separation. And thus, the Greek word translated there as death means that separation, whether violent or natural, of the soul and body being separated, which uh, when life is terminated here upon earth. With that in mind, doctors don't give up on trying to save the life of a person when there are no vital signs there. They use CPR, cardiopulmonary resuscitation, which includes a combination of breathing, chest compression, and electrical shock. Any one or a combination of these may revive the person and the vital signs of life be brought back. And then newspapers erroneously have headlines that the doctors brought someone back to life. They didn't. Not in modern times. The spirit had not left the body. Certainly it would momentarily, evidently, if the vital signs had not been revived. The Greek word breathless has reference to the unborn child as well as a newborn babe and children. It's translated five times as babe, one time as child, one time as infant, and one time as young, young children. In Luke 1.41 and Luke 1.44, it refers to the one that became John the Baptist. And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. Luke 1, 44, For lo, as soon as the voice of the salutation sounded in mine ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. The next two passages refer to Jesus as a babe. Now keep in mind, the ones referring to John the Baptist was before he was born. He was referred to as a babe. It's the same Greek word that refers to Jesus after he was born. In Luke 2, 12, And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. Luke 2, 16, And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Then in Luke 8:15, 8, 1815, pardon me, it translated infants. In Acts 7, 19, it translated as young children. In 2 Timothy 3, 15, as the Apostle Paul is addressing Timothy, he says in that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. That's the same Greek word that referred to John the Baptist before he was born. And then at 1 Peter 2, verse 2, this same Greek word is referred to new converts. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Infanticide is the killing of infants. And we've discussed at the first part of our lesson about those in ancient times offered their infants to idols. In today's society, 
Even mothers have killed their own children. We're reminded that in 2001, Andrea Yates acknowledged to the police at Houston that she had grounded her five children in a bathtub. Now, whether or not she was legally insane when she did that, I'm not in position to say. But I do know this, that society is moving toward that type of attitude as time goes by, a larger number favors partial birth abortion. The worst decision ever made by the Supreme Court and the other laws related to it was Roe versus Wade. How did that come about that legalized abortion? In the state of Texas, this state here, in 1970, a woman by the name of Norma L. McCarty legally sought court approval for an abortion. She claimed that she had been raped. Two Pennsylvania State House attorneys, Linda Coffey and Sarah Whittington, represented her in fill filling out a suit in a U.S. District Court in Texas on her behalf. Henry Wade, a Dallas County District Attorney, represented the state of Texas. Norma, uh, pardon me, Norma L. McCarty was referred to as Jane Rowe throughout the court proceedings. It wasn't until 1972 the Supreme Court heard arguments for and against the suit. And then in January 22, uh, 1973, a decision from 7 to 2, the Supreme Court struck down the Texas law against abortion. The inconsistency of the court's decision was seen in that the one that was taking the lead in outlawing abortion, Judge Harry Blackman, admitted he could not determine whether or not the fetus was a person or not. If, he had, if they would admit the fetus was a person, then it would have a protection under the 14th Amendment. The Roe versus Wade decision set up a system of trimester pertaining to developing uh, the fetus. It, it was ruled that the state uh, could not restrict a woman from aborting her child during the first trimester, the first three months of pregnancy. She could destroy the life, have the li uh, life of her child that was growing in her own body for any reason she wanted during that first three months. During the second trimester, the fourth through the sixth months of pregnancy, the state could restrict abortions or allow them in consideration of maternal health. And during the third trimester, the seventh through the ninth months, abortion could only be granted to preserve the life and our health of the mother. Now Norma L. McCarvey, alias Jane Rowe, who began this litigation in March 1970, had already given birth to the child that she wanted to destroy. She later had a change of heart. She became a member of the pro-life movement in 1995. She now or at least she has continued to pursue the effort to make abortion illegal. Here is what she said to Congress. Quote, it was my pseudonym, Jane Rowe, which had been used to create the right to abortion out of legal thin air 
but Sarah Weddington and Linda Coffey never told me that I was signing, what I was signing would allow women to come up to me 15, 20 years later and say, thank you for allowing me to have my five or six abortions. Without you, it wouldn't have been possible. And then Sarah, she, she says, never, she says, Sarah never, referring to one of the attorneys, never mentioned women using abortion as a form of birth control. We talked about truly desperate and needy women, not women already wearing maternity clothes. This was her testimony before the Senate Subcommittee on Constitutional Federation and Property Rights filed 1998-01-21. She sought to reopen her case before the U.S. District Court in Texas. Her desire was to overcome Roe versus Wade, but the Fifth Circuit Court here in Texas ruled that her case, the McCarty versus Hill, was moot. The only hope of overturning Roe versus Wade, this terrible decision by the Supreme Court, is to uh, have good, godly men that believe the Bible, men that do not try to make laws, but interpret the laws that are on the book. The state laws against abortion had existed for more than 150 years prior to Roe versus Wade. Brian R. White and William H. Rehnquist stood alone in casting their votes against that decision. And this is what Rehnquist said, quote, to reach its result, the court necessarily has had to find within the scope of the 14th Amendment a right that was apparently completely unknown to the drafters of the amendment as early as 1821. The first state law dealing directly with abortion was enacted by the Connecticut legislature. By the time of the adoption of the 14th Amendment in 1868, there were at least 36 laws enacted by state or territory legislatures limiting abortion. While many states have amended or updated their laws, 21 of the laws on the book in 1868 remain in effect today. That's what he was saying in 1973, uh, which is listed as Roe v. Wade, 410 U.S. 113. You can find that on the finlaw.com uh, website. So whether or not Roe versus Wade will ever be outlawed, there's no hope in the near future. We certainly cannot depend upon the present president, Obama, to select godly men who would overturn Roe versus Wade when he was a state senator in Illinois, he voted against the bill that would have provided medical care for blocked aborted infants that were still alive. Abortion's legal history in the United States after Roe versus Wade, Congress passed a law banning partial birth abortion in December 1995 and again in October 1997. President Clinton vetoed them, both of those bills. Again, in November the 5th, 2003, Congress presented a bill banning partial birth abortion under President George W. Bush in which he signed in the law. The constitutionality of that was uh, immediately challenged in three U.S. district courts. All three of these district courts declared the law unconstitutional after citing the omission of an exception to the health of the mother. The Bush administration 
appealed the lower court's decision under the Supreme Court on April the 18th, 2007, by decision of only five to four. The Supreme Court held that the partial birth abortion law did not violate the Constitution. It's against the law for partial birth abortions today. But how long it will remain that way, I don't know. Our nation is going through a great culture war. The moral fiber of our nation is breaking down. We as a nation are rapidly approaching the immoral state of Sodom and Gomorrah. Are there enough conscientious people in America to save this nation? If there had been only ten righteous people in the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, God would have preserved those cities. Solomon said, Righteousness exalted the nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Proverbs 14.34 American soldiers during the history of our nation are only less than 3% of those that have been murdered by abortion since Wade versus Roe became law in 1973. Statistics of the number of abortions since 1973 is approaching 49 million according to the National Right to Life. In comparison, all of the military of the United States since the beginning of this country to the present time is something like 1,204,000. Where is the maternal instinct of pregnant women who would dare take the life of their child. The babe developed in their womb. Here in America, there are approximately an average of about 3,500 abortions a day here in the United States. There's 86,400 seconds in a day. You divide that up and that means that just over every 24 seconds, there's an abortion here in the United States. And that's not even talking about other nations. It's just the United States alone. The federally funded Planned Parenthood Incorporation performs more abortions than any other organization or clinic. The so-called Planned Parenthood organization promotes both abortions and freely provides contraception for teenagers. It is able to do this by receiving millions of dollars from our federal government and uh, in the year 2005-2006 uh, fiscal year, they obtained over a billion dollars from the United States and from the general public. The Planned Parenthood Incorporation continues to speak out against politics and wants the government to stay out of it, but give us money. There is a greater protection and concern for the lower species of life than for the unborn human life. The same year that Wade versus, uh, Roe versus Wade came into existence, Congress passed the Endangered Species Act. It did not include protection of fungi. It protected all types of plant life, vertebrates, non-vertebrates, but it for some reason or other, they include fungi. That means that the unborn infant is no better than mildew and mold, according to that. The Humane Society is more concerned about protecting rattlesnakes than the unborn infants. You can go to their website, and I have 
that in the book, their their website, they're attempting to stop rattlesnake roundups in Texas, Oklahoma, New Mexico, Kansas, and other states that has such. But they're not pushing to outlaw abortion. Very inconsistent. If a young woman chooses to have an abortion, she may later regret doing so. Even so, there is no way the life of her aborted infant can be restored. She'll have to live the rest of her life knowing that she was responsible for the death of a fellow human being, her own child. But they'll argue. It's part of her body. One of the men of the congregation gave me a good point a while ago. Often, that body in her is a different sex than what she is. Of course, be a male. Or a different blood type. It's not her body. It's a different body. And she's going to be held responsible for the rest of her life. There, those who hold... Uh, to abortions are going to have to answer to a greater power than the Supreme Court of the United States. Let me say a little bit here. Uh, here in Texas, in the Panhandle, there was an organization called American Le uh, Life Leagues, or Stop Planned Parenthood, who have been instrumental in forcing out 19 uh, clinics of the Planned Parenthood from the Panhandle of Texas. We need to get busy and outlaw it out completely out of the state of Texas and, and out of every other state. Uh, let me end up by saying I'll include how I got got my nickname Dub, and of course Brother McClair can tell how he got his. But uh, I was the last of the litter. I refer to myself as the last of the litter in my family. I was the youngest. The last time I saw my dad, he was in the hospital at Texas County, and he told told her I was in my forties at that time. He told her that I was his baby boy. Well, anyway, uh, there would have been seven of us. The first two were boys. They either were stillborn or died at birth. The next three were girls. And then my brother and me. My mother had a hard time uh, with me. And... Uh, when she gave me birth, they didn't think I was going to live. At that time, my dad had later had a furniture store and a car agency, but at that time, at that early years, he, he was a trucker. He had his own truck, had his name on there. He said, well, we'll just call him W.O. One sister, my dad's name was William Oliver. One sister was named after him, Ollie Jean. My brother was named after him, William, and... William Luther, Luther after my granddad, my dad's dad, and we call my brother Bill. And so I just end up with initials. Well, here in the South, we don't pronounce the word W with a L. We just say W. And a lot of people drop that U and it's Duff. So I, I uh, instead of being... Uh, I decided to change that when my oldest son came along. I, I called him Paul. <laughs> and and uh, I decided it was time to change all that. But anyway, I appreciate very much. Thank you. I, I thought you and Double Fish were twins. <laughs> And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, 
fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, malignity and whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedience to parents. And that's just talking about the government officials. <laughs> without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful. Now, if there's ever a case of someone not having a natural affection, it's one who would abort a child. And they are to be condemned, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death. Not only, only do they uh, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do it. And that really is more indicative of the position that the current administration is taking. They have pleasure in these things, and they will promote it. Uh, we're going to be faced with it, and we're going to have to uh, uh, deal with this, not only this, but other things that uh, will come as a uh, attack upon uh, our very basic Christian beliefs. As someone said, I forgot who it was, that better get ready. I think it was Doug. You better get this Doug. Better get ready because it's it's coming. Uh, hate crimes or what have you, it's coming. And I really believe it is, and we're going to have to deal with it. Now, let's stand. This